for tuning in tonight. Uh, if you can believe it, this is our last virtual monthly meetup uh, for the year, but we're already working on um, our 2023 programming, so stay tuned for that. Uh, as always, thank you to our generous sponsors, our Genix, Alexion, Jansen, UCB, and Immunivant for allowing us to host these virtual sessions. We're so very grateful for that. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am Meredith O'Connor. I am the St. Louis Program uh, coordinator at the Myasthenia Gravis Association um, and work with Allison and Catherine to um, make these virtual monthly meetups possible. But um, a quick note about December is that we will be having a virtual group offered by Argenix called Vivgart University, uh, which is to take place on December 13th from 5.30 to 6.45. And you can sign up at um, www.vivgart, and then it's university, like Y-O-U, university. I will send the link in the chat um, uh, for you to uh, check that out. So, um, and then lastly, don't forget, check your emails for any end of the year programming, especially ones that are taking place in your area. And of course, um, we would appreciate it if you guys could fill out the survey uh, following tonight's meeting. Um, but now for uh, the presentation we've been waiting for. Uh, tonight's presentation, as you know, will be about plasma phoresis and myasthenia gravis. Leading tonight's presentation, we are lucky enough and fortunate enough to have two presenters. Um, and leading this will be Kat Purcell and Christy Liqueur. Liqueur, I knew I would butcher that. <laughs> Sorry, Christy. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I will go. Let me go ahead and introduce them both. Kat received her BS in nursing from UMKC in 2017. She's worked at the University of Kansas Hospital Health System, initially in the Folk Slope Pool, and as a new graduate nurse, then cross trained to mother baby as well as the dialysis and apheresis units. Additionally, Kat obtained her PCCN certification during that time. And in the middle of 2020, she transitioned to full time in the dialysis apheresis unit uh, and stepped in as a relief charge when needed. Uh, Kat officially moved into the role of dialysis apheresis unit educator in 2021. And then Christy is also a nurse and has been for more than 40 years. Her experiences include hematology and oncology, emergency room, intensive care, and acute dialysis and apheresis. She has taught dialysis apheresis theory and practice for 15 years, traveling around the U.S. for classes. She has been an affiliate clinical faculty at the KU School of Nursing since 2016 and became a full-time faculty member in 2019. She continues to work PRN in the KU inpatient dialysis and apheresis unit. Uh, thank you both Christy and Kat for joining us tonight. We are so fortunate to have you both with us and share uh, your wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away. Before I, actually before I let you take it away, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat or Q and A, whatever's enabled. Sometimes the chat box isn't enabled. So, um, and I will look at those and we'll try to have sort of an interactive session. Just we'll welcome those questions as they come and uh, hopefully Christy and uh, Kat can uh, answer them as as they come in, okay? So, all right, giving, it, giving you guys the floor now. Thank you so much, Meredith. And thank you so much for inviting us to speak this evening. I'm excited as is Kat. Um, my friend and colleague in the dialysis apheresis unit. Kat, would you like to introduce even more? Yeah, sure. Um, so like she said, I've been a nurse for about five and a half years now. Um, I started out as a float pool nurse and then cross-trained over to dialysis whenever they needed um, help and then fell in love with the patient population. The staff that worked down there was really interested in doing the apheresis side of it too. And so I joined dialysis and was lucky enough to take over the unit educator position about a year and a half after joining them. Um, I've learned a whole lot. Um, I've learned a lot from Christy as well. She's always open to my questions when I have them. She's definitely got a lot more experience than I do. Um, I am a mom to a baby on the way, and then I have a dog and two cats at home. And then I will let Christy introduce herself some more. So I am an identical twin and my parents seemed to think it was really important to dress us exactly alike. 
I have answered to hey you my entire life. So don't feel bad if you don't remember Christy. K -U, uh, um, hey you works just beautifully. The other part of my name, liqueur, I used to tell my patients like a fancy French liqueur until one of them started calling me the wino lady. And then I thought maybe that was not the right thing to say and quit telling them that. I have three wonderful young men as sons. They are absolutely delightful and brilliant, of course, if I say so myself, and the most beautiful daughter-in-law, and she is also delightful. Um, I, uh, I also have a menagerie at my house, three dogs, two cats, and five parrots. It can be very noisy there. As Meredith said, I've been a nurse for over 40 years. I figured it up tonight and it's actually 45 years. And I've been in the dialysis at apheresis unit for the last 30 years. Um, first with a, a private physician and then with Davida and now with KU. I absolutely love dialysis. It, it truly captured my imagination and the science behind dialysis and apheresis is phenomenal. And I, I'm such a nerd, I love that. But teaching at the, the School of Nursing is also a challenge. So I enjoy that part as well. As Meredith said, please don't hesitate to ask questions or if you have comments, certainly put those in the chat. We'd like to address them at the time you have them so we, they don't get lost at the end. I wanna start out by talking about some of the terms that we use. So apheresis is kind of like Missouri, Missouri. It can be apheresis or apheresis. It simply means to take away. So we perform multiple forms of apheresis. We take away white cells or red cells or plasma. When we're talking about plasma, we are talking about the actual liquid part of the blood that carries red blood cells, all of the different kinds of white blood cells, as well as platelets through our blood vessels. You've seen those little tubes of lab drawn. If we allow those tubes to sit, they actually separate into components. The plasma is that light yellow part, and it makes up about 55% of the total blood volume in, in our bodies, as well as in the tube. Then you'll see that little kind of orange line. We call that the Buffy coat. The Buffy coat makes up white blood cells, all of the different types of white blood cells, as well as platelets. And then the last dark part are the red cells, and that's about 45% of the total blood volume. In addition to being a carrier for red blood cells and white blood cells, the plasma contains minerals and vitamins, salts, hormones, enzymes, antibodies, and other proteins. Plasma itself is a protein, but it is a carrier for other proteins as well. The main function of plasma is to carry proteins and nutrients and hormones to the tissues of the blood that need it and to carry waste products away. When we say plasma exchange as part of our terminology group here, Plasma exchange isn't the only name we go by. Sometimes you'll hear us say TPE, meaning therapeutic plasma exchange. We may also call it PLEX or just plain plasmapheresis. What that entails is to take away the plasma and replace it with the fluid that your provider orders. In several different disease processes, not just myasthenia gravis, we actually 
um, are able to move or remove the products of that disease to help the patient improve their health. There are multiple medical conditions that produce harmful antibodies or proteins. And that's why we do plasma exchange for people. So um, for other disease processes, and there are many, many of them are neurological. Some of them are not neurological, but can affect certain organs of the body that we do this for. Um, and the really cool thing about doing plasmapheresis is you get to see a change pretty rapidly. This actually helps a lot of people. So the definition of therapeutic plasma exchange or plasmapheresis is a therapeutic procedure, as it says here, where the patient's blood is taken out of their body and put into a machine, not all at once. We are only taking about 110 mils, less than a half a cup. It goes into a centrifuge within the machine that we use, and it separates the plasma into other components. Then the blood and the white blood cells and the platelets are returned to the patient, patient but the plasma is removed and then replaced with that replacement fluid as ordered by the doctor. Sometimes that's albumin, sometimes that's what we call fresh frozen plasma. Um, to replace that volume in the same consistency. We don't use things like normal saline or um, lactated ringers because it isn't the same viscosity. We want to replace with the same volume that we take away. The plasma waste that we take out goes into a bag that hangs behind the machine. And Kat's going to show you a picture of that here in just a few moments. And once we replace it and put it back into the system, it all goes back into the bloodstream as a whole. Our rationale for doing plasmapheresis for any procedure is to remove that pathological substance, those antibodies or those proteins that are causing the disease state in the patient. In many instances, plasmapheresis or therapeutic plasma exchange can more effectively remove that substance than the patient's own body. Many times that pathological substance has overwhelmed the body and a person's body just can't keep up. The patients not only benefit from removal of that component, but ultimately the replacement of fresh albumin or plasma. And the beauty of plasmapheresis is that it can be done in conjunction with other forms of therapy, other medications that you're on, we just have to time those medications appropriately. We talked about the general part of plasmapheresis with specifically myasthenia gravis. We are removing those circulating antibodies that cause problems with the acetylcholine receptors. In all of these disease processes, the pathogens are not just floating in the blood. Oftentimes, and typically, those pathogens have also entered the tissues. So when we are removing plasma, we have to look at what's going on with the patient, 
and the providers decide how much plasma we're going to take off. Um, you can see in this little graph on the left-hand side of the screen, years ago, they started doing studies measuring the amount of plasma we exchanged. Is it just a single plasma volume or is it more than that? And they discovered that doing a plasma volume worked very well in most patients. However, with patients in crisis, whether that crisis is myasthenia, Guillain-Barre, or other things, when they're in crisis, that volume changes to maybe one and a half of a total plasma volume to get the best effect. But I really like the graph on the right because that explains a little bit better why we don't do it every single day. I just talked about how with the pathogen in the tissues, think back to your high school chemistry days and concentration gradients. Remember that from chemistry? So when we deplete the vascular space or the blood of all of those pathogens, it gives the opportunity for, for pathogens or antibodies or proteins, whatever it is, to shift from the tissue back into the vascular space. That's not a fast process. That doesn't happen in hours. It actually takes about 48 hours. So we often do a treatment and then wait two days and do the next treatment. For patients in MG crisis, we will do a total of five treatments often depending upon the symptoms that we're seeing. And you can see with each successive treatment, how we drop the concentration of IgG or those abnormal antibodies. This is great, Christy, thank you. We have a question. Sure. Uh, if good antibodies are also removed, isn't the immune system compromised? So maybe could you just, yeah, talk a little bit about the good antibodies and versus bad? Excellent question. I love that. Good job. Um, yes, unfortunately, we cannot singly um, just take out the bad stuff. Everything comes out with that. And we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit as we go through. Not only are we taking the bad antibodies, but the good antibodies. Um, and vitamins and minerals and other things. So we watch these patients very closely to ensure that their immune system is not compromised. Um, most of the time you will rebuild those antibodies on your own while you are being given a drug that also helps with the MG. Mary, does that answer your question? Yes, I believe it does. It absolutely does. Excellent. Please, that was great. I really love that you asked just then. Very good question. Kat, take it away. Yeah. Um, so Chrissy, can I give you the background of the disease process and what we're doing with plasmapheresis? Um, I'm going to explain more of that machine that we're using. So we use a brand called Spectra Optia. It's our choice for our apheresis system. It's very user-friendly. It looks a little intimidating when you look at it the first time, but there's a lot of pumps, readers, um, things like that inside the machine so that I can safely keep an eye on that treatment and make sure everything's going the way it's supposed to. Um, on that machine, on the very back, it's kind of hard to see a little bit, is that collection bag that Christy was talking about. That's where we're taking that plasma that we've taken out of you and we're collecting it back into there because we don't want to give it back to you. And then we're going to give you some fresh either frozen plasma or we're going to give you albumin. So for the treatment to work properly, we use something called an AIM system inside that machine. And so that AIM system uses optical detection. So you see little sensors kind of on the inside of that machine where that centrifuge is at. That centrifuge is that white, big white plastic piece you have. 
it's reading on the inside of that to look at where your plasma is at, where your Buffy coat, that white blood cell platelet side is at, and then also where your red blood cells are at. And so that centrifuge, what it does is it helps make those components separate by using like specific gravity because red blood cells are heavier. So they'll sit more towards the bottom. That Buffy coat will be more in the middle. And then that top part is that plasma and that's gonna be the lighter stuff. So the system's taking out the plasma and wants to give you the Buffy coat and then your red blood cells back. Um, and then we have a screen that tells us exactly what's going on inside that machine. And that's what you see with those bars, that first bar that you see that's completely cream colored, that's all plasma. That second bar is more of plasma on top, red blood cells in the bottom. And then that third one that you see is the plasma on top, the Buffy coat in the middle and the red blood cells on the bottom. That screen is also telling us what your pressures are to make sure that your axis is working properly. We're not worried about clotting off or anything like that. Tells us how much time you have left on your treatment, um, how much we've already processed, taken away from you, and then how much you've gotten of what we call ACDA, which is an anticoagulation that we use to make sure that you're not clotting our system off while we're doing this. And we'll go over a little bit more of that too at the end of this. All right, Chrissy, you can hit the next one for me, please. So there's that blood component that Christy showed at the beginning, kind of like that tube, how it separates on its own. Our AIM system and that centrifuge inside of the machine is doing that um, by spinning. It's kind of a very fast spin, uses, like I said, that specific gravity to separate those cells at. And that's kind of like a nice graphic of what's going on inside the machine of that plasma to Buffy coat and that packed red blood cells. Um, we give the red blood cells back constantly. Typically the machine will hold onto those platelets until it hits a certain amount. And then once it hits a certain amount, it'll give those platelets back to you. Cause we want you to keep your clotting factors as well. All right, Christy. Come on, <laughs> my button's not working. Oh no, it's all good. There we go. So we have to enter specific information into the machine. The machine calculates total blood volume for us. So in order to get that information, we have to have an accurate height, weight, and certainly your biological sex. Um, that information gives us the blood volume, but then remember how we talked about the different plasma amounts if we're doing a single plasma exchange or a plasma volume and a half, we have to be able to calculate that plasma volume. In order to get that, we take the total blood volume and then also have to have your blood count or hematocrit in order to figure that properly. So having your lab drawn almost immediately before the test or the day before this procedure is really important to us. We will ask to get your weight every time you come so that we're putting in the most accurate volume or accurate information to get our volumes to make it as safe as possible for you. All right, let's talk more about what we're taking out. So like Christy talked about, there's lots of things that ride in that plasma. You've got hormones, you've got vitamins, minerals, you've got proteins, a lot of other different stuff that's riding around in that. So of course we're taking that out. So you have your circulating immune complexes, you've got your immunoglobulins, those antibodies, those proteins, the paraproteins, albumin, albumin has a lot of protein in it. Um, so that's why we're replacing you with the albumin or we're giving you that fresh frozen plasma. Um, and then fibrinogen, which is a clotting factor. Um, so in the hospital, when we're running multiple treatments on patients that are in an acute exacerbation of MG, we draw your labs daily. And one of the labs we're looking at is that fibrinogen. And because it's a clotting factor, we want to make sure we don't drop you below a certain amount because that puts you at risk for bleeding. And so based off of that lab value, our physicians, our pathologists that write our treatments, they will decide whether or not we'll replace you with albumin only or we'll give you that fresh frozen plasma that has extra clotting factors in it so that we're not depleting you too much. 
Um, it also pulls off urea and creatinine. This is why it works for some of our patients um, who have different disease processes, such as those that affect their kidneys. Um, it also takes off things like electrolytes. So specifically calcium, magnesium, and then we also worry about potassium a little bit as well. Um, the biggest one that we focus on when we draw your labs is that ionized calcium. That's free floating calcium in your body. That's not, it's not bound to any protein. And why is that important is because we're giving what I call that ACDA. It's an anticoagulant earlier. That anticoagulant likes to bind to calcium. So if you don't have enough in your body, we're going to give you some more. Every patient gets calcium chloride during our treatments. That's replacing what we're binding to. That decreases your risk of getting things like numbness, tingling in your mouth, um, tips of your fingers, nose. It also prevents any arrhythmias because calcium actually has a direct effect on your heart as well. Um, and then we're also taking out things like cytokines and then the vitamins and minerals and then some medications. So this is why it's important to talk with your doctor prior to coming to see us on um, which medications are safe for you to take prior to plasma, apheresis, or if you need to take it afterwards. So some things that come off in that plasma are some sorts of chemo. Um, you can have cardiovascular agents, some blood pressure medications, antiarrhythmics, any immunosuppressants, which some MG patients are on. So that's why we're very cautious if you take them beforehand or afterhand. And then stuff like anticoagulants, anti-epileptics, and then anti-infective agents. So that's like antibiotics, antivirals, things like that. So especially while you're in the hospital, we're monitoring a lot of things, but if you come in more on an outpatient, we'll draw labs either the day before or the day that you're there, base your treatment off that. And then we have you ask your provider on which medications you can and can't take before treatment. Kat, you basically addressed it already, but I just want to reiterate, there was a question about blood thinners such as Xarelto. Um, you know, what sort of, what, I guess, more generally speaking, what, um, what sort of do blood thinners have an effect on the plasmapheresis process? Yeah, so um, it's more on like bleeding on access, but when it comes to the medications, the reason why some of it comes off in the protein is because some of those medications specifically bind to protein. They have a certain percentage of how they bind to that protein, and that depends on how much it's gonna take out. Um, sometimes we're a little bit concerned about um, anticoagulants if we're, depending on what kind of access you have. So like if we're sticking you for like a peripheral IV or if you have like a permanent access like a fistula or a graft or sometimes ports, then it kind of lets us know ahead of time we might be holding a little bit more pressure on you. Um, we do have a few patients that take um, anticoagulants and it literally is just more hold time for bleeding um, for them, but we know which meds they're on to kind of help with that. I hope that answers that question. Christy, do you have anything else to add on to that Nancy, as well? Nancy, it's so good to see you here. Nancy Hupp is the woman that answer, asked the question and I've known Nancy for years and years. Um, thank you for asking. That is a fantastic question. Nancy, the, the Xeralto is not going to adversely affect the treatment at all. It certainly is going to help us make sure that there's no clotting in the system. But the anticoagulant that Kat was talking about, what we call ACDA, is a drug called citrate. Xeralto is a systemic anticoagulant. It anticoagulates all the blood in your body. The citrate only anticoagulates the blood in the tubing because we're giving you the calcium back after the blood has exited and we have pulled off the old plasma, the effect is no longer there. I hope that makes sense. Um, it, so in all actuality, that citrate isn't affecting you systemically, but only regionally within the, the centrifuge. Patients get a very, very minute portion of the ACDA that we use in our system. It's more for, like Christy said, the inside of the machine. So it's not physically clotting inside all of the tubing and inside the centrifuge. Patients get a very, very, very small amount of that ACDA actually to them. Um, 
it's just mainly in the machine. Mike, I see your question also about the balance of the body's ions and electrolytes. You are correct. And Kat's going to address that here in just a moment. Especially though, the ones that we're concerned about are the calcium, um, the magnesium and the potassium. So we want to be sure that you have adequate ions and electrolytes and that's why we test you prior to the procedure itself. We may need to replace those as we go, or we may just ask you to be sure that, especially with the magnesium and the potassium, that once you get home, you take a vitamin or you eat specific foods that contain those particular electrolytes. Does that help, Mike? Perfect, thank you. All right, so preparing to come and see us. All right, so the number one thing we need is access. So this sometimes depends on the conversations that physicians have with patients. Um, if you're in-house with us, um, our top access for us is called a non-tunneled catheter, and we'll talk more about that in the next slide. Um, for outpatients, they're more tunneled catheters, ports, or like an apheresis or a um, fistula or graft. And then we do have a couple of patients that opt to just do peripheral IVs, and we'll kind of discuss that too. Um, scheduling works as your patient, your uh, physician goes ahead and they contact our pathology department, and our pathologist will go ahead and call our unit and we'll reach out to you to schedule how many ever appointments they want you to have. If you're in house, we automatically start scheduling for at least five, and then it's up to the physician if they want to push it out to seven. Um, like Christy said, we do accurate heights and weights, especially that first treatment. And then we typically weigh you every single time that you come in just to make sure that we have that adequate um, blood volume. So you're getting a good treatment. We're also going to draw lab work. We're going to look at your hematocrit, your hemoglobin. That hematocrit helps us program the machine. We're looking at the electrolytes again. We're looking at um, how's your potassium doing? Is your magnesium okay? Do you need some replacement? How's your ionized calcium looking like? Um, are we giving you the basic amount of ionized calcium or the calcium chloride that we use to replenish your ionized calcium we're depleting? Um, do you need extra than we normally give? Um, do we need to give you some Tums? Because Tums are actually great fast acting calcium that we can give you if you do start having symptoms of having numbness or tingling in your mouth. And then we look at that fibrinogen, fibrinogen which is that clotting factor as well. We also wanna make sure you're hydrated. So we wanna make sure that you're drinking plenty of water and consuming high products such as like calcium. So cheese, milk, we wanna make sure you have a nice meal before you come and see us. Um, that'll kind of help regulate uh, with blood pressures, obviously making sure that your electrolytes are good and that you're well hydrated for us as well. Um, we also ask, like we discussed before, you talking to the physicians beforehand on which medications are safe for you to take before you come and see us and which ones you need to take after you're done seeing us. Um, we want you to know that it typically takes about one to three hours, especially for drawing your labs as an outpatient. It can sometimes take at least 30 minutes to get those labs back and on average about an hour and 45 minutes for treatment. Um, that kind of just depends on the experience of the nurse that's doing your treatment. It also depends on which replacement fluid we're using. If it's your first treatment, we're going to go slow and steady. We're not gonna run you at very high speeds. We wanna make sure that we're not gonna make you nauseous. We're not gonna have any complications and stuff like that. And then as you come and see us more, or if we're doing in-house and you're admitted and we're seeing you every other day for those five treatments, after that second treatment, we typically increase the speed at which we're running as long as you tolerate it. We have vitals machines running on you every 15 minutes. For blood pressures, we have your cardiac monitor up at all times to watch you. If you're getting blood products, we're doing your temperature just to make sure you're not having a reaction to any of those products that we're giving you. Um, we want to make sure that you do come to us with something to do. It's kind of boring staring at us for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> so we say we have TVs in our base. You're more than welcome to watch that or you can bring your phone. Um, make sure you bring a charger, though. Those are hard to come by sometimes. Um, tablet, books, whatever it makes you comfortable. Um, some people bring in 
stuff to help them sleep. Cause I mean, I'd take an hour and 45 minute nap <laughs> if I could. Um, and then, um, we used to allow patients, family members back. Um, however, with COVID, a lot of those protocols changed, um, especially since we do have open bays in our area and we have kind of halted our visitor policy. Sometimes we do make exceptions though for that first treatment. Cause we do know that's a little nerve wracking for some people. Um, Christy, am I missing anything else for the beforehands? I don't think so. I think right. you hit every button there. Okay. Um, typically, because it does take an hour and 45 minutes and we are shifting fluids, it's often a good idea, even after we've drawn your blood, just before we start the treatment to run to the bathroom. Definitely. Yeah. And then you're not kind of panicking because you mm -hmm. have to go so badly. All right, types of access. So we do have some patients that opt for that peripheral venous access. Another name for that is a peripheral IV. Um, those are usually our outpatients. And then you have to have very good vasculature to do that because we're having used anywhere between like a 16 to 18 gauge needle for that. And so you have to have two of those so that we can do your treatment. Um, most common ones for inpatients are is that non-tunnel that, um, which is the central venous access. That's the picture that you see on the screen. Um, those are typically placed in our interventional radiology. If you're in the ICU, they're, they're placed by the ICU team. Um, those are not meant to stay in forever. Those are a quick little, they stay in for five treatments. We personally take them out. They're not tunneled. Um, they have dressings over them. Um, we do ask you to be cautious though, when those are in, they're very easy to kind of snag on clothing, especially where they're located at. Um, and like I said, we take those out when we're done. Um, the other option is a tunneled. Those typically are in your chest. Um, they're tunneled because they have a cuff on them that sits underneath the skin. It allows the skin to grow over that, um, cuff and then acts as a barrier for infections for you. Um, those are for patients that need like a longer term treatment that we're seeing outpatient prior to them getting something more permanent, such as like a graft or a fistula or a port, um, which have less of an infection risk to them, um, allow you to kind of have more of a normal life with those tunnel catheters. You can't go into pools, lakes, hot tubs, stuff like that. They're very hard to shower with on because you have to put plastic wrap over them. Um, so they're kind of like a longer, but short-term kind of access as well. Um, a lot of our patients that we see outpatient eventually end up with a graft or a fistula. What that is, is it's a, um, access where they have gone in and connected an artery to a vein. So it allows the supply to pull from the artery and then give back to you on the venous side. Um, we do have, we do know that's not comfortable getting stuck still with about 17 gauge needles for that. So we do have like lidocaine injections and emla cream and stuff that we can help, um, with numbing prior to accessing. And then we also have things called ports. They're called apheresis ports. They're good for about a thousand accesses. They do sustain the blood flows that we need to run these treatments. They're nice because they sit under the skin. Um, you usually can't really see them unless someone's looking for them. We do have to place two of them though, because we have to be able to pull from one and then return in the other. Um, and those are kind of basic ones that we have. It's typically a physician to patient preference on which ones they're more comfortable with having. Um, so during that procedure, so from studies about 40,000 TPE procedures, average time is about a hundred, I'm sorry, not a hundred, oh my goodness, an hour and 45 minutes. Um, please let your nurse know if you have any concerns prior to starting. Um, like Christy said, please use the bathroom before we start because sometimes the hour and 45 minutes with shifting fluids will make you have to go when you're done. Um, those treatments depend on how fast we're running your blood flow rates. Like I said, if it's a very first start, we're not going to run you very fast. We want to go low and slow. We want to see how you're going to react to having your blood pulled out and then us giving you fluid back, plus how you're going to react to that ACDA, that anticoagulant we're using. Um, and it also depends on if we're just giving you albumin, we're doing albumin with that fresh frozen plasma, or if it's hundred percent, just fresh frozen plasma. Um, that usually depends on your labs and it also depends on the disease process. We do have some patients that only get fresh frozen plasma. 
Kat, we have another question. Yeah. Um, approximately what percent of MGers have symptoms which develop during plasma or plasma exchange that require immediate intervention? And honestly, Mike, our nurses a patient. are very <laughs> attentive. Yeah. Um, we are standing right there beside you the entire time. We're, as Kat said earlier, we're watching your heart rate constantly, your blood pressure every 15 minutes. And we ask on a fairly frequent basis, how are you feeling? Any numbness, any tingling? We don't want you to have a reaction. We want to prevent those, if at all possible. In doing the lab work pre-treatment, we actually have very few adverse reactions to the process. Um, I would definitely say less than half yeah. of the patients have anything unusual happen during the treatment because we stay on top of it. Does that yes. help, Mike? Yeah, it just depends patient to patient, but typically not really. Um, that's why we want you to be hydrated and eat before you come. That decreases your risk of nausea while we're doing, while we're moving your fluid around. Um, citrate reactions um, can happen with that anticoagulant we use, but we don't see it very often. It's very rare just because we are doing your labs beforehand. So we know what your calcium looks like. Um, we are monitoring your vital signs. So we can see if you have a drop in blood pressure very quickly um, and respond to that by either giving you like a normal saline bolus. Um, and then we turn down the pump. Maybe your body's just not able to handle a quicker speed and that's fine. We're more than happy to go slower as long as we're not giving you any side effects. So some of those side effects that hypocalcemia, um, which we talked about, that's, um, low calcium in the blood, that numbness, tingling, um, arrhythmias that comes with binding calcium to that ACDA. That's why we replace you with the calcium chloride and then we have your labs beforehand. So we kind of anticipate it. Um, if you do develop that numbness or tingling, we can give you Tums and those Tums are actually very quick acting on relieving those symptoms. Um, low blood pressure, we are moving your fluids around. Um, so you can kind of be at risk for that low blood pressure. We just run a slower inlet. We can give you um, a little extra normal saline if you need it. Um, some patients, instead of running a fluid balance of hundred percent, we can run them at 110%, which means they're getting a little extra fluid at the end and that makes them feel better after treatment. And that's really fine. That's why we ask how you're doing, how the last treatment went, see if we need to make modifications to your treatment. Um, allergic reactions more common when using fresh frozen plasma. So we do premedicate. We can premedicate with Pepsid or Benadryl. We give that IV decreases your risk of reaction to that. Um, electrolyte and vitamin imbalances. We've, we talked about that a little bit earlier as well. Um, taking like, um, vitamins after treatment, stuff like that will help maintaining that healthy diet and making sure you're eating high calcium, rich foods, high potassium, rich foods prior to coming to see us. Um, pain at needle site. That's more common with, um, using peripheral sites than it is for using anything like catheters, ports, and fishes and grafts, feeling tired or cold. You're going to feel, you might feel tired either from some of the medications we've given you. Um, we are shifting your fluids around. Sometimes that makes people sleepy. Um, we do use blood warmers. So when we are giving you your blood back, we're giving it at a decent temperature. So we're not kind of shocking your body to something a little bit colder than what you gave to us. Um, and then we have lots of warm blankets. We're more than happy to pile upon you and dig you out of later. Um, and then that dizziness and lightheadedness. And that's again, from moving those fluids around and kind of shifting them around a little bit. Um, that's why we take your blood pressure before, right when you're done. Um, we rinse back all your blood at the end of treatment. You leave with everything. Um, and sometimes a little extra at the end. Um, and then we're very slow to get you up after that first treatment, just to make sure you don't get dizzy when you stand up. Many times this can be mitigated, especially the low blood pressure issue and the diet, the dizziness and lightheadedness, if our patients are well hydrated, it's really, really important that you are not dehydrated when you come in to have plasmapheresis. Um, it, it really, truly makes a huge difference in your 
overall treatment and how you feel at the end. So that pretty much wraps up what we were going to talk about. Um, in summary, plasmapheresis or therapeutic plasma exchange is an immunomodulatory therapy, meaning that we change that immune the immune numbers in your blood for neuromuscular patients that's used as primary, secondary, or in conjunction with other therapies, depending upon the disorder that we're treating. After many years of doing this, we know it to be safe and for the most part well tolerated with the majority of reactions being very mild. And Tums usually fixes that or better hydration. Hopefully it's convenient to the patient, most importantly, that we can do it either outpatient or as an inpatient. We can do this using lines that we put in, the central venous lines, the fistulas or grafts, or we can try the peripheral accesses if you have the most wonderful veins ever, the kind that we like to stand across the room and throw darts toward. Um, and it definitely can be used in conjunction with other treatments. Oftentimes with many of our patients, that combination of treatments is what puts the disease back into control. We wanted to provide you with some of the resources that we use to put this together. Here's a few of those things here, but certainly reach out if you have questions or um, concerns about apheresis and Kat and I can certainly get you more inform information. That was so wonderful, ladies. Thank you. I mean, that was just so thorough and so really just you broke it down so beautifully. Um, so thank you so much. I do have a question uh, myself. Um, I see a lot of times like patients will, whether it's plasmapheresis or IVIG or um, maybe some of these newer infusion therapies that like after years of doing them, that it stops maybe the the therapeutic effect isn't as strong anymore what why do you under what is like the hypothesis behind that or why why does that happen sometimes for some patients and two how come some patients don't respond to treatments like plasma phoresis honestly we are all different and i can tell you now at the age of 65 that i am not at all the same person i was at 30. so as our bodies age and our body's capability of responding, because you know, after about 40, our immune systems don't work as well as they did when we were in our 20s and 30s. So it's kind of natural that our response to those drugs changes as well. Unfortunately, that's kind of the way it goes. Um, and certainly, we all respond differently to drugs. Where Benadryl might put someone to sleep, if you give me Benadryl, I am flying around the ceiling and crazy tachycardic and my blood pressure goes through the roof. Really? I can't take Benadryl at all. Wow. So all of us respond differently to different treatments. Sure. And, yeah. and it's just, unfortunately, some people respond well to one thing and not the other. So it, it really depends upon each person's body and as we age, how our bodies change. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious because I've seen it, uh, you know, in numerous people that I've, uh, numerous patients that I work with and, um, you know, they're always like, well, why is it stopped working for me? Or, you know, they're kind of like, shoot, like, what do I do? And so I always, you know, I'm just so grateful we have multiple treatment options now and we're continuing to, um, you know, increase those options. So, um, but I was just curious if there was like a, yeah, physiological explanation behind that. But, there um, definitely is. Yeah. <laughs> there definitely yeah. is. Yeah. Um, it's amazing to me, the things that they're coming out with. Um, yeah. 
it, honestly, in 45 years of nursing, I have seen so many advances. And MG is just one of those now that I'm seeing almost by leaps and bounds, new therapies and things that are coming out. And it is absolutely phenomenal. It really is. It really is. I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, this, there's, it's astounding what's happened in the MG space. Um, I did. And then there's one last question I have for you. Um, you know, I, you, you stated that uh, plasma phoresis can be used as a primary or secondary or in conjunction with, you know, it used to be at least when I was initially diagnosed considered like an emergency therapy, um, especially for like generalized as, which is what I am a CHR positive. Um, mm -hmm. do you, do you see that? And now I know you probably see it differently in your clinic, but maybe on a wider scale, do you see that changing as well? Like, do you see that, um, other people are using it as a primary and secondary, um, treatment for myasthenia gravis, or do you think it, do you think it's just a uh, preference by physician or what, what are some of the factors that have played into that? The presenting symptoms. Yeah. So if they're seeing the drooping in the eyes or patients are having difficulty swallowing, more importantly, if they're having any respiratory compromise, it becomes the primary treatment. We need to jump on this and we need to do it fast because plasmapheresis is going to show um, a change or um, an improvement in those areas quicker than blood can. The body is overwhelmed with all of those antibodies and we need to get rid of them quickly. Yeah. No, that makes sense because I guess if you are experiencing respiratory, that is definitely considered on the emergent side. So, I mean, it, it goes hand in hand, but I definitely remember back in, back in the day when I was, you know, um, really sick and them saying, you know, it was mainly used as you know, rescue therapies. They said it, that's what it was, but I, I see now people using it all the time and I think it's great. I think it's a really I mean, everything you guys said is just, it gives me comfort too. And knowing that if I ever need plasma phoresis again, that, you know, if you have people that know what you're doing and are taking care of you and that are really knowledgeable in this field, there's so much that goes into this that I know you guys didn't even cover. So um, thank you for explaining it uh, so well. And you're getting a, a praise and applause um, in the chat. So please feel free to look at that. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. If anyone ha has any other questions, please, we have five minutes less left. So if you want to use the time, don't feel, uh, don't hesitate to reach out for questions. You guys um, are amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, oh Allison. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. You laid out all the information so clear. I think it was really helpful. Thank you, Allison. And Nancy and Mike, we appreciate your comments so much. Thank you very much. Um, and